15 minutes past midnight, Evers got out of his car beside his home in a Negro residential area. In a vacant lot about 40 yards away, a sniper fired a single shot from a high-powered rifle at Evers' silhouette. The bullet hit him in the back, crashed through his body, through a window into the house. He died within an hour at a Jackson hospital. City wow. As we start the first full week of Black History Month, we celebrate the legacy of an often overlooked civil rights leader. In her newest book entitled Medgar and Murley, The Love Story That Awakened America, MSNBC host Joy Reid delves into their lives, giving a fresh look at a couple whose work has influenced millions who continue fighting for civil rights and includes interviews with family members and colleagues. And Joy joins us now. Uh, congratulations on the book. It's great to have you on Morning Joe. Thank um, you so much, Mika. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, tell us everything about this. What drew you to the project and what, what surprised you when you delved into the life of Medgar Evers and his wife that you didn't know as you were looking back in history? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It is great to see you. Um, and you know what drew me to this project was Merle Evers uh, Williams. Um, I got the chance to, I'd interviewed her remotely, um, but in 2018, um, I was in LA doing my former show, my weekend show, and got the chance to actually meet her in person and interview her. Oh. And she was just, first of all, so compelling. She's just so regal and so royal and so incredible. And she's got this deep resonant voice and fabulous and incredible. But after the show, after the segment, I had a, a personal conversation with her and she started talking about Medgar. And the way she spoke about him, I said to her, Miss Murley, you sound like a teenage schoolgirl who just Aww. met this man. This man has been gone for almost 60 years. And she says to me in her deep resonant voice, Medgar was the love of my life. And it just Aww. moved me so much that when I, you know, fast forward, I'm trying to tell my publisher what I was going to do my next book on. And I didn't want to do another Trump book. I'd done a Trump book. Uh, I wanted yeah. to do something else. And I just came back to that conversation over and over again because I said to her at the time, Miss, Miss Murley, that's that's the story. You need to tell the story. And she says, oh, darling, I've written so many books. And I said, no, but this is the story. You've got to do it. And so I reached out to her, reached out to the family um, and, and to see if they would be open open to her talking about this. She's written two incredible books. You know, she helped Manning Marable put together uh, Medgar's papers. And she agreed to talk with me again. We spoke over half a dozen times, including once in California in person, this incredible all day we spent with her. And I, I just, you know, what drew me to the story was her and her love for this mm. man. And I wanted to write a love story that also tells the fuller story of the civil rights movement. It wasn't just these great men they had families who supported them and created the space for them to be able to do what they did. And as for what surprised me most was how reluctant she was to do any of it. She was like, she really was a 50s housewife who just wanted her man to be home Aww. and sell insurance. Like she was like, I'm gonna marry an insurance salesman and instead I got a civil rights leader. And that was not her plan at all. And how open she was to talking about her reluctance because she knew that wow. what he was doing was gonna get him killed in Mississippi and she didn't want him to go, but she knew he was not going to live long. Joy, as, as, as you know, I, I've been around Mary Evers uh, frequently yeah. uh, or, or, or many times over the last couple of decades. I was too young to know Beth, Edgar, Medgar. And, and you're right about her regal presence. I mean, yeah. even in the most private moments, she's yes. like royalty. But two things. One is the role that the wives played. Yes. Uh, the wife of Dr. King, Coretta yes. Scott King. I, I, I argue who I know knew Mrs. King even better. It wouldn't have been Martin King the way we know him without Coretta. The Absolutely. same with Betty Shabazz Absolutely. with Malcolm. Marilee Evers was the backbone and, and cold thinker with Med Evers. I, I went last year. Uh, at uh, uh, the family's invitation that did the 60th anniversary of mm. his assassination in Jackson. Yes. And they kept the house the way it was Absolutely. when he was shot in the driveway coming home that night for doing voter registration. Yeah. Talk about the power of those women. And also something I think we miss in history 
is that Matt Gavins was killed in June of 63. That's right. And that was part of the impetus that brought a lot of people to Washington right. for the original March on Washington in August. People don't understand that tragedy sometimes galvanized people. And a lot of people went to Washington where Dr. King did, did the I Have a Dream speech yeah. because they were still outraged That's about right. the assassination of Matt Gavins. Talk about those two things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think people... And this is one of the other really impetuses for writing this book, as I feel that Medgar Evers has been sort of lost to history um, as the important figure that he was. I mean, James Baldwin said the great trio, the great triumvirate of, of civil rights was Ma Martin, Malcolm, and Medgar. And right. he rode with Melker, Medgar into the Delta to see him do the job that he did. And he was doing all the things they were doing, but in Mississippi, which is its own adventure in terms of being a black person at that time. But you're absolutely right. These, these wives were the secretary. They were the cook when Lena Horne came to the house. They right. were the person that had to feed all of the civil rights activists who were coming to the home to do this this work. And yes. they were in the case. And some stayed there because of segregation. That's they where they couldn't had to stay, stay at hotels. That's Absolutely. Right. So they were putting up all of the greats. You know, the Dick Gregories of the world were staying at the Evers home. That's right. where they stayed. And so these women were integral to the process. And Betty Shabazz, uh, Coretta Scott King, and Merle Evers also became what they called uh, the, the sorority that no one wanted to be in, which we now know the mothers of the movement say the same thing. Exactly. You know, Merle Evers was the first nationally known civil rights widow. He dies in June of 63. The, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, the president, had given the speech in which he used some of Medgar's language. They were both World War II veterans, and he had been pressing the Kennedy administration to actually do more on civil rights, to send uh, federal troops to Mississippi to protect black people. He was integral. He was literally going, he was, you know, had he not been assassinated, was going to be in D.C. to testify for the Civil Rights Act that he was one of the ones pushing for. And his language about first-class citizenship was picked up by people like Fannie Lou Hamer. Right. Um, and so he was integral to it. When he was killed, to your point, Dr. King had given his initial version of the speech he gave on August 28th at the March on Washington. He gave it in Detroit, as you know. Yeah, he gave Frank. it in Detroit, yeah. exactly, to 22,000 people. And one of the lines that later gets cut out of the speech he gave in D.C. was, I have a dream that one day people like Medgar Evers and Emmett Till will be able to live their full lives in freedom. Oh, that wow. line gets cut out uh, of the uh, March on Washington speech, but that's in his original dream. And it, the galvanizing moment for that speech, they did it on the assassination date of Emmett Till, of the, the date that he was lynched. But Merle Evers was the only woman invited to speak with the big six. She couldn't do it because she had an NAACP commitment, but she would have been on that dais. So, and the last piece I'll give to that is that when Kennedy comes through on the bill that he promised, he invited Merle Evers Williams, Merle Evers, then just Merle Evers, and Charles Evers, Megger's older brother, and Merle's children, and they stood in the White House and he gave them all little gifts. The gift he gave Merle was a copy of that bill. Oh.